let's continue with semantics and talk a little bit about humor, sarcasm, implicature, and end on a serious note with presupposition. So let's start with talking about Grice's maxims. And Grice's maxims are this bridge between what we say and what we mean. Now, when we have conversations, we say a lot of things. And according to Grice, we adhere to something called the principle of cooperation. In other words, when we have a conversation, we always try to make it so everyone in the conversation can understand us. We benefit the conversation when we contribute. And we're not trying to confuse other people. In other words, we have these set of conventions that we're aware of that we follow because we want to have good conversations. The first maxim, and you'll see very quickly that we don't always hold true to these maxims, would be the maxim of quality. So the maxim of quality says we should speak truthfully and never contribute false beliefs. So for instance, if I want to talk about how far away the moon is from the earth, I would not give a number if I'm not 100% sure about it and have evidence. But in conversation, we violate this all the time. So for instance, here's a conversation. George failed his exams. He's very smart. Okay, where's the violation? Well, clearly, if he failed his exams, he's not very smart. So what is this? We violated the maximum of quality to do what? Well, to express sarcasm. Violations of quality can lead to sarcasm, or they can just lead to completely false beliefs or lies. But in this case, it's being used sort of in the sarcastic sense. And as speakers, we know, especially in English, that when someone violates this and says something clearly false with a certain tone, it's sarcastic. There's lots of languages in the world that do not have sarcasm in them, so when you say something that violates the maximum of quality, they get very confused and they take it seriously because they believe you're always speaking truthfully. The next maxim would be the maximum of quantity, and this says do not contribute more or less than required. Once again, we violate this all the time. So if you're asked a question like, uh, what did you do yesterday? You should tell someone exactly what you did from start to finish with no additional detail and not leaving anything important out. So I woke up, I did some chores, I went to bed, the end. Well, that's kind of a violation because that's not everything you did. But if you describe the things you did, that's also a violation. Here's a more interesting violation on the screen. This is a conversation between two people. A says, they have two dogs. B asks, will they buy a third? And then A responds and says, oh no, they already have a third. Okay. Now this is super weird, because in A, they said they have two dogs. Why wouldn't they say they have three dogs? This is a violation of quantity. So we expect people to contribute the necessary information. So if B is starting this conversation by saying, oh yeah, how are these people, do they have any pets? And you say they have two dogs. Well, you're not providing enough information. So when you ask this question, will they buy a third? And A says they already have a third. I mean, B is thinking, like, excuse me? Like, why didn't you tell me this information? Because A has violated the maximum of quantity by saying they have two dogs in the first place when actually they have more. The maximum of relevance is very clear. Uh, be relevant. Now, this maxim is usually violated when we want to be polite. And I know this sounds weird. Wait, we're violating a principle of conversation that's supposed to be beneficial to be polite? Well, here's an example. How did he sing? Oh, he looked wonderful. Notice how B is not being relevant at all. We're asking about singing, and B is responding that he looked wonderful. But what's really being said here? What is B saying? Well, B is saying that he sang terribly, but he doesn't want to say it directly. So by being irrelevant, by making a statement that has nothing to do with the conversation, B is expressing that someone's saying really, really badly, but they're too polite to say it directly. So that's the maximum of relevance, and we violate this one a lot. Finally, the maximum of manner. The maximum of manner is really ideal, but if everyone followed it, we would have the most boring conversations ever. Because it says, avoid ambiguity and obscurity, 
So no ambiguous sentences. We can't say let's go to the bank later. We have to say let's go to the river bank or let's go to the money bank later. We have to be brief and orderly. So if we say something like, could you maybe please grab that thing in the garage for me if you have time? Oh, we have a huge violation here. So for instance, according to the maximum manner, uh, we shouldn't say maybe because that's unnecessary. That's not being brief. I already said could you. I don't need please because why would I need please? That's unnecessary. That thing in the garage, okay, this is not specific enough. For me, this is probably necessary information because I'm explaining why I want it. And if you have time, well, this is unnecessary information because that's just being polite. So we have a huge set of violations for the maximum manner here. But can you imagine how boring and rude conversations would be without the maximum of manner or with the maximum manner? Could you grab the, thi uh, the tool on the top shelf on the left side in the garage for me? Yes, I will do that. Actually, by saying I will do that, that would also be violating the maximum manner because you already said yes. Amazing, right? So if humans actually followed all four of these maxims all the time, our conversations would be terribly boring. When we ask questions, I mean asking a question in the first place would be sort of a violation just to start a conversation, but answering in anything more than four or five word statements that are brief and concise, well, you'd never elaborate. You'd never have an interesting conversation again. So the point being is that we violate these maxims all the time or we flout them. Another way of saying violating the maxims would be to flout the maxims. And we use this for sarcasm, as we've shown before, politeness, as we've shown it before. We use it for puns, too. The maxim of manner, manner says avoid ambiguity. But lexical ambiguity is what makes puns. So if we follow the maxim of manner, we can never have terrible puns again in our lives. And what would I be without puns? I'd be an unfunny man. I mean, I'm already an unfunny man, but I'd be even unfunnier. That'd be terrible. So I need to keep violating this maxim of manner in order to make myself funny. To me. Anyway. Okay, I'm just getting depressed now. So, those are the maxims. And they're good to know from a pragmatic perspective, because you can explain things like humor in terms of these maxim violations. Now, the last two things we'll talk about are implicature and presupposition, and we already kind of covered implicature when we talked about the singing example. And this is when sentences have hidden meanings. And in my example, we used it to be rude without being directly rude. And a lot of implied statements happen to be a little rude in English. So for instance, in example one, let's say you meet someone after not seeing them for a long time and you say, oh, did your gym close down? What are you really saying? You're saying, oh my God, you got so fat, what happened? But you don't want to say that. You don't want to say, oh, well, you gained weight. You want to ask kind of a nicer passive aggressive question, like, did your gym close down? Or two, if you ever go on ratemyprofessor.com, uh, there's one phrase you should always, always worry about is when there's a comment like, she's a very nice teacher, or she's a very nice instructor, or she's really good one-on-one -on -one in her office. You do not want to take a course with people who have he or she is a very nice teacher as their biggest point for their reviews. Because if you're saying this, you're not saying anything about their teaching quality. All you're doing is saying a characteristic of the person. So you're avoiding the question because that person is a really, really terrible teacher. But she's nice. Yeah, she's very nice. In fact, when students ask me about certain professors sometimes, all I respond with is, yeah, she's a very wonderful and lovely instructor. That's all I'll say. And from that, if the person, you know, understands English, understands my implicature, then they'll say, okay, thank you, I'll never take a course with that person. So this is what implicature is. Now, on the other side of implicature where we have hidden meaning, Sometimes we miss this, right? Sometimes we miss the hidden meaning and we take it literally. There's this term called presupposition where if you miss the hidden meaning or the implicit assumptions in the sentence, it can get you in a lot of trouble. So for instance, 
Let's just go right into a sentence and then we'll explain presupposition with this sentence. Imagine you're in a courtroom. You're sitting up there in front of everyone and of course you have a lawyer coming over to you. He's walking towards you and the first thing he says, do you regret killing him? You have to answer yes or no. But no matter what you answer, yes or no, you're admitting to killing someone. That's because this word regret presupposes that you've already done something. So this is a presupposition. So be because I say, do you regret killing him? I'm assuming that you've already killed him. So this is our assumption is you've done it already. So this is why in courts, you can't ask these leading questions, these presupposing questions, like, do you regret killing him? You have to ask, did you kill him? Because in a panic, you can say yes or no and not realize that the sentence leads you to pleading guilty regardless of how you answer it. The only correct way to answer this question was, I did not kill him. But that's so much harder to come up with than just yes or no. The second one is, have you quit smoking? The word that is presupposing here is quit. Because if you say quit, you presuppose that someone has already started. So if I meet someone new, I say, have, have you quit smoking yet? I mean, depending on who the person is, if they say no, they might think about it for half a second and say, no, I, I never smoked to begin with. Uh, my great-grandmother, before she passed away, for instance, uh, I never smoked, but she would ask me with her Alzheimer's disease, she'd ask, oh, have you quit smoking? And then every single time I had to say, actually, I've never smoked before, but of course she didn't remember that. But the question had a presupposition in it. She was presupposing I had smoked thanks to her memory, but in reality, I had never smoked before. So I can't just answer that question, yes or no. I have to I have to essentially say, no, your assumption about me is wrong, and I have to explicitly state it. So that's the second video on semantics. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below, and I will answer them the best that I can.